All right, welcome to another episode of the Nebraska Gentleman. Today, we are joined by a very special guest. Uh, she comes from the National Football League, where she works with its current and former players, providing resources and education to support them in their transition from on the field to retirement as a player engagement manager. She is also a former Springfield College Athletic Counselor Master's student, so we share that connection. Um, please help me welcome Ms. Carla Lyde Buglione. I think I got it right. I you hope got it right. <laughs> excellent, excellent. How are you doing today, Carla? I'm really good. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. I don't do this often, so I'm getting out of my comfort zone. <laughs> Making me feel special. So my first question for you, Carla, if you don't mind sharing what it is that your position all entails, because somebody that like myself, we join this field of sports psychology. We have this dream of potentially being and work with professional athletes. Can you describe to us what all your job entails and how you got there? Yeah, so um, my current role is to equip players with programs and resources that are designed to help them succeed off of the field. And so that includes anything from helping them figure out a budget, um, to educating them on social justice initiatives, um, as well as domestic violence awareness. Um, so my work really does focus on players' growth outside of the sport themselves. So that's, that's pretty much what I do in a nutshell. Um, but my journey and how I got here kind of started in college. Um, I majored in behavioral science, which was a field of psychology. I always knew I wanted to do work in psychology, um, but when I found out that Springfield College had a program on athletic counseling and I did my research, I was kind of like, wow, I can marry my two, my two passions together. And that is studying the way people think and, and act um, with sport and movement. And so I played sports my whole childhood into high school. I kind of broke my dad's heart. I went from being a basketball player to probably being able to play in college and then deciding, nah, I think I'm going to dance in college. And so I started my college uh, first dance team ever. Um, and so, like I said, broke my dad's heart. But uh, I knew that this was a really cool area for me to work because I had experience as an athlete and I had a passion for helping people. And so to see that that kind of lived under one umbrella at Springfield College was something that I became really excited about. Um, so went to Springfield, did all of my work there, and then decided that I needed to stay in the collegiate space so that my dream job, which I guess you could say I kind of have now, um, would be better for me if I had more experience. So I then went to Fordham University and I worked as an academic advisor there for about four years. Um, loved helping student athletes, especially the football team. They were extremely successful then. They won the entire championship, I think like two or three years in a row under Joe Moorhead. And I was, I was, I guess you could say I can, I help them get to their success uh, by running study hall and making sure that the football student athletes knew exactly what to do outside of the game. And it's so interesting how that kind of parlayed into my current role at the NFL. So after four years of doing that, um, this position at the league became available and I, I applied, I used my network um, and all the resources that I had gained through Springfield College, um, through Fordham University, and I applied and I got it. And it's so interesting. I'm pretty much doing the same exact thing. I'm just working with players who make a lot of money, um, not just student athletes. So it's interesting how you come full circle with the whole athletic counseling piece and and what I'm doing currently. So that's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> what a great one. How many years now? So I am oh, five years in, five and a half. I make six years 
February 2021. So. Yeah, it's a good month for you then, the Valentine's Day and, and that. But I do got to say, I, I imagine your dad is pretty proud yeah. considering, one, dancing is still a sport, it athletic, is. and it now is. you are, I think he's okay with where you're at now. He's very okay with it. He, <laughs> he loves, he's not a football person, he's a basketball person. Um, okay. However, he loves that I am involved in sport, and more importantly, um, I married a football, a high school football coach, um, and my son is one years old and looks like a linebacker and is tackling kids already. So <laughs> everyone's like very yeah, really. absolutely, absolutely. Um, Carla, can you share what are some of the challenges that maybe you have faced in these five years so far, whether it was professionally with colleagues? and or with some of the athletes that you have worked with so far? Sure. So um, as a female in a man's world, you're always going to kind of run into this, I guess you can say, um, challenge where, you know, you're one of eight people in a room and you're the only female and you know that you have to work just as hard, if not harder, because you're only you're in a marginalized group to begin with, right? So you walk into a conference room and as the only female, you know that you shouldn't just sit back and observe, even though you probably, you're new to the team and you probably shouldn't kind of um, make a splash or ruffle feathers by speaking up and saying your piece. It's, it may not be the time or the place because you're new or because you are the only female in the room, but to that point, you kind of have to in order to show that you can run with the big dogs who are all men. Um, so for me, that was a real challenge coming from an academic setting, which is more balanced, um, especially in the world of academic advising. It was even a little bit more, it was more male at Fordham University. Um, but there were also more females involved too, who I work with on a day to day. What, then I go to the NFL and that's not necessarily the case. And so while the counselor in me would want to kind of sit back and observe, right, that psychology, uh, sociology perspective to really be a sponge, knew that it's corporate. I really can't, there's not a lot of time to sit back and observe because someone will come in and replace you in a second. And you're a female, so the stakes are high, you've really gotta prove yourself. And so with every meeting I go into, I make sure I say something. Even if it's not groundbreaking, even if it's not the newest, most innovative, flashy thing in the world, I know it's important for me to put my voice in the room so that people know I'm not afraid. And that just because I'm a female doesn't mean I'm not gonna try. And so that has been a challenge, kind of a recurring challenge throughout my five years because um, with changes in leadership, um, with, with colleagues coming and going, right now I'm the only female in my group. There are about eight of us. Um, and like I said, with every call, with every meeting, I make sure that my voice is heard because I don't want anyone to think that I've gotten complacent um, or, or comfortable. I think it's really important in corporate America as a woman, add the fact that I'm a woman of color. So that, that's kind of like a, a double-edged sword in a way, um, but it gives me two marginalized items where I have to work and think and speak that much more effectively. Um, and so the challenge is really there, but it's, it's not a bad thing. It actually motivates me in a lot of ways because there are so few women who look like me up at the top level at the NFL that I know the fact that I'm even at the table is something that's very important and that's groundbreaking in and of itself. Um, but it doesn't stop there for me. So I really have to interject. I really have to share my opinion. Um, I really have to always be on constantly. I can never just be quiet 
I can never just be observant. Um, I can be, of course, in my quiet moments, but when I'm in a meeting and when I'm around the team and I have got to be poignant, I've got to be professional, knowledgeable, astute, informed, whether that's on X's and O's of what's going on for, for a football operations conversation or knowing what's going on with social injustice today and how our president of the United States is looking at that issue um, and being up to speed on all things. It can't just stop at the current programs that I'm running for players. It has to, it has to be deeper. And so I'm constantly trying to educate myself. I'm trying to read all the time. Um, in my quiet moments, my pleasure reading, my leisure reading is business oriented. It's about leadership. It's about growth and development. That's actually something that's fun to me and interesting, um, but it's also educational and it's professional development. So once again, a very long response to that question of challenges. Yeah, but it was a it was an important response. And I have so many ways I want to navigate <laughs> and branch out from each. My first one, really, Carl, you have with what you were sharing, because one thing I'm thankful for Springfield College and the classes that we took in the athletic counseling program, one of them being on working with diverse populations. And through that, one of the things I learned was my male privilege. You hit on a lot of a lot of great things that I think everybody, especially as men, can grow mindful and be aware of. You have a lot of expectations set on you. And like you said, those two things, not just being a female, but a female of color. How do you take care of yourself when you are having to think and be reminded of that almost every day at work, especially being one of a people and the only female? Because mm. one might think it could be exhausting. You said it's a, cha it's a challenge you welcome, but I really am interested in how you work with that. It's a great question. Um, it is a challenge. I find that talking things out to my husband, to my parents, um, to my mentors is really helpful for me because it creates a checks and balance, right? Like I know that I'm gonna go to my husband and I'm gonna get that football coach response that I need, right? So he's gonna be like, no, you messed up. And here's where you messed up and here's how you can fix it. Ready, set, go. But then I can go to my dad and I can say, this is what happened. And I get a completely different response. It's a, a little bit more compassionate. It's that father daughter, um, yet also an athletic mindset, being that he had played basketball and I did too, and he was my coach. And so he provides some of that tough love as well. Um, but then knowing I can go to my mentors and get a whole different response. So talking it out is something that's very helpful for me. Um, also doing yoga and meditating and finding quiet time to reflect. Um, I really try to go to bed at night thinking of one really good moment from that day. A lot of it does involve my son um, and my, my husband and family, um, but to be reflective and introspective uh, at the end of the day is really important for me. So talking it out and I would say like a meditational component are very therapeutic and help me because you're absolutely right. It's, it's 100% exhausting and working in corporate America, it's very hard to turn off the email and it's, it's hard to turn off. Even when you do turn off the email, it's hard to turn off your, your thoughts because you're constantly thinking of what you need to do that next day to make sure that you're a badass in the meeting, in the conference room, on the call, on the Zoom. Uh, so I'm constantly going mentally. Um, so checks and balances and meditation. And I think uh, you reminded me of just how many ways athletic counseling continues to play a role in our lives, even if the specific role is in counseling. And I heard the accent there with daughter. So I'd like to actually touch on that. And hear more on in what ways, Carla, have you noticed where you come from shaping you? First of all, can you share with people where you come from? Sure. 
So um, my father is African American, um, born and raised in New York. And my mother is Caucasian. She is born and raised on Long Island. Um, so that accent really is like Bronx, Long Island. It's really New York City heavy. Um, so Judy would be very proud of me for curtailing my accent. <laughs> um, for those on the episode or listening in, Judy is someone who we have in common. Um, she is the director of the athletic counseling program at Springfield College, a mentor of mine, um, someone who has really guided me in my career the past 10 plus years. Um, is it about 10? I, I don't know. Yeah, just about. Um, but anyway, did your math so, right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I am from the Bronx, um, born and raised. I went to Catholic school my whole life up until college. Um, college was a Lutheran school, Concordia College. There are quite a few Concordia colleges throughout the nation. I went to the one in New York. Obviously, being a stone cold New Yorker, couldn't leave um, until Springfield came across my my plate and uh and then i said i guess i have to go to massachusetts and deal with red sox fans and patriot fans and you know i'm a yankee fan through and through i feel your pain yeah it's not easy really not easy <laughs> but i loved it it got me out of my comfort zone and and, and it, it made me grow as a person you know so um that's where i'm from that's a little bit of where i'm from so, and you hit on this earlier too, the challenges you know, face compared to other people that may not look like you. I'd like to learn, if you don't mind sharing, in what ways or what instances, if you um, can remember experiences where you face adversity and you believed it was because of the color of your skin and your gender. Yeah, so um, there was a point in my five years where um, our department was actually very diverse. Um, we did have another female, about two other females. And racially speaking, there were a lot of people of color. Um, it, it, was, it was really cool. I've never been a part of that. I've never experienced that. Um, but to that, being biracial comes with challenges. Um, Fortunately, I'm brown. And so it's very easy for me to say, I'm a woman of color. Um, but sometimes that's confusing to a white person who I'm speaking to or working with, because they're like, but you sound white, so I, I, but, but you don't look it. So I'm confused. And then to the black person, it's kind of like, okay, so clearly your parents made you go to school and you know how to speak. Um, and you are brown, I, I can tell, and so we can relate, but you do sound white. And so make sure that you're, you're team brown. And so, and I say that because that's, it's a challenge I ran into um, being at the NFL. I was not black enough for my black counterparts to lead a certain project or to understand a certain decision that was made but I also am not white enough to lead certain projects and understand certain decisions that are made. Um, but it's interesting because at the NFL, there really aren't too many people who look like us, people who have pigmentation, people who have black dads um, and black grandfathers. And so while I'm thinking, oh, cool, I'm a part of this brotherhood and sisterhood, well, there's layers to it. And there's something called colorism that rises to the surface that I have to be aware of. And so I, I walk a very interesting path at the NFL, being a person of color. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm not black enough and I'm not white enough. And so that is a challenge that I face quite often actually. And again, does it go back to your self-care and how you deal with this issue? Is there other things that you have done? Because I'm curious to learn what you do with this that you just talked about, how you take care of yourself for that, and then also what advice you'd give for somebody 
who looks like you wanting to do the exact same things you're doing when they're uh, when they're officially in the working field. Mm -hmm. So the self care piece when it comes to this, uh, it's very personal for me. This is not something that I'm going to run to all of my mentors and talk about. This isn't like a quick fix, problem solving, tangible. This, this is almost like systemic in a way, the colorism piece, right? So like it goes all the way back to when my black grandmother would say to me, well, you're, you're darker than a brown paper bag. And back in the day when there was slavery and there were, there were issues of this, if you were lighter than a brown paper bag, you were considered white. And so luckily, I guess in this instance, I passed that brown paper bag test in the eyes of my black counterparts, right? Um, so anyway, to, to get back to your, your question, it is very personal for me. And it's something that I can really only talk out to other people who are in this same exact situation. So I have a best friend who is also biracial. And she has dealt with this. And so I go to her, I lean on her um, for moral support um, so that she can listen to me and she can help me kind of get back to confidence on the, on the topic or on the issue. So I definitely lean towards my biracial family um, and friends, but also to my white mother and black father who are very much aware of this, right? Because they decided to get married and have children. And um, with that comes a lot of awareness. And so I talk a lot of this out with them, um, but also my white husband who works in a predominantly black and brown school district um, and coaches black and brown young men um, whose best friend is from Kenya and clearly married a brown girl. So uh, gets it, gets it, is sensitive to it. I can get emotional right now, but I'll try not to. Um, so once again, we're coming back to that talking it out. I lean on my real, real close knit group to, um, to get that support and that guidance. Thank you for sharing that and being open because it's not something easy to talk about. I'm just thankful that you do have people around you and in your circle that you can feel open to discuss, you know, these things. And um, it was beautiful. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. One thing I'm very curious about too, with these two pandemics going on, the coronavirus, and you mentioned it too earlier, systemic racism. How has that impacted your job and your work right now during this time? So speaking from a day-to-day um, -day standpoint, once the pandemic hit, we were in our busiest season in my department. So if you think about it, our number one goal is to help players off the field. So during the off season, which starts in February and runs till about June or July, that's our craziest time. And so we were planning, I was planning to leave my seven month baby at home for the first time and be on the road for like weeks at a time. Um, so that was a whole other level of crazy. But now the pandemic hits, we can't go anywhere. And so everything is virtual. Everything is, is online. Everything is through Zoom and the phone. Um, and I was tasked with coming up with webinars and educational learning opportunities for players on the fly. So I would bang out these webinars that hour long on certain subject matters that players needed um, or were planning to attend and experience a broadcasting webinar because players want to get involved in sports commentating when, when they're done playing. Um, so an opportunity there, uh, a finance webinar, how to navigate your personal finances during a pandemic. I had to lead that. Real estate, should I flip the house that I was planning to flip? This, this off season, should I not? Um, educating them on, on that. And so crazy, the pandemic hit and we were, I would say I've been busy up until last week, like a crazy person. Um, in front of the Zoom, every hour, on the hour, 
Not to mention new leadership came over my department during the month of March, right after the pandemic hit. And so navigating new leadership while executing at a very fast pace was an interesting, stressful uh, challenge. <laughs> um, then the social justice movement comes about on the heels of George Floyd's death. And I can't tell you the flood of emotions at the NFL was something I'll never forget. It was so powerful to see colleagues um, so vulnerable, black colleagues, brown colleagues, get on a Zoom in front of the commissioner of the NFL and spill their heart out, uh, you know, sharing their personal experiences with social injustice telling their stories and seeing the white counterparts, our Caucasian brothers and sisters, listen in with eyes wide open and ears completely open and emotions running very, very high. So we went from crazy, crazy work mode to a pause, like a humane pause, where people were clearly concerned, emotional, and open. They were open to anything. I mean, I had white counterparts texting me, colleagues who I've never heard from on a text message basis, saying, I'm here for you. I don't know what to say, but I'm telling you that I stand with you. Whoa. What, what, what is this? I remember turning off the computer for the night and turning to my husband and saying, I'm just drained. I don't even know what to say to these white counterparts. And I'm someone who prides herself on quick communication. I think that that's so important in today's age. But I just, I didn't know what to say back to these white people who were trying to connect. I, I knew I wanted to say something poignant and something that would resonate I wanted to educate. I wanted to remind them that this isn't just like a, hey, sorry that, you know, your brother died or your sister died. It's, it wasn't like a bereavement text. So I knew I needed to be really thoughtful and mindful on my response, emotionally draining. Um, that whole week or two was just really emotionally draining. and. I had talked to some colleagues outside of the NFL and a girlfriend of mine works at CBS and she said, oh yeah, we, we had like the whole week off almost. Like we didn't really work that week post George Floyd. I go, what? You didn't work? What does that mean? The NFL didn't really stop. We, we paused, but we, we didn't stop. And I had shared some personal stories um, about being a person of color, getting racially profiled, getting pulled over just because I'm brown. Um, my brother getting stopped and frisked on the number one subway a couple of years ago because he looked like somebody who, who the police were trying to find. And dealing with that, the circumstances of getting racially profiled and, and stopped and frisked in New York City. This isn't out in, no offense, the Midwest where there's randomly black people and, and everyone's eyes are wide open because they're afraid that there's this one black person on the subway or on the, in the train car. No, this is Manhattan where brown and black people are all over the place. And, and my brother getting stopped and frisked is like, and dealing with that as a family. Um, so I, you know, I shared all of that amongst my teammates and uh, very long story short, that whole week or two was really emotional. Um, and I am still emotional about it. However, being who I am, I'm very action oriented. I knew that we needed to do things at the NFL. So I joined I had emailed someone who is in charge of social responsibility, not my boss, 
but a woman who I've worked with in the past. And I said to her, I need to be involved in anything action oriented. It's I'm passionate about it. I'm a woman of color. There aren't many of us include me. And so I inserted myself because I knew that anything that was going to come out of the league really needed to be done the right way. Better be thoughtful. It better be vetted by black and brown people at the NFL. It better be inclusive. It better be different because if not, we're going to lose a lot of fans. We're going to lose the most important part of the NFL. And that's the player because the player population we forget is 70 to 75% African-American. They're clearly affected by what's going on in the world right now. What's going on in our country right now. What's going on down in DC right now with the president of the United States. And that's great that we're working really hard to have a normal season. And I really have my fingers crossed that no NFL players get sick, but we can't lose sight of this social justice movement. And so being on this task force that I inserted myself on is really exciting. Um, but also once again, that word challenging comes back into play because not a ton of brown and black people on that call. And um, if I could say one thing to the Caucasian leaders of the NFL, it would be don't just stop once this is over, once this movement has kind of settled down. Keep listening to your black and brown employees because I bet you more than likely they understand this better than you because they've gone through it. They go through it. They live it. They breathe it. They experience it. And so vet your ideas, vet your initiatives, double check with them, not saying, hey, are you doing okay? No, bringing them into the fold and including them into the decisions actually was just talking to a mentor earlier and it was about professional development. So I always check in with him once every couple months. And he said something to the effect of strike while the iron is hot. If you're passionate about social justice, parlay this into something, Carla. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you're going to do. That's going to make it, you know, your next career title or position but strike while the iron is hot. And I, I would like to say that to those Caucasian leaders who are above me. Um, let's strike while the iron is hot, but let's, let's bring in my counterparts, me, <laughs> women, diversity in making some of these decisions because what has worked in the past, it hasn't. They might kneel again. They might, we don't know but they are fired up, they are emotional. They are going through those seven stages of grief because, because of George Floyd, because of Breonna Taylor, because of Ahmaud Arbery, um, because this country is in complete disarray right now from a humanistic standpoint, we're not doing very well. And so the number one sports league, which is the NFL, really needs to get it right. So I'll get off my soapbox, and I hope that that answered your question a little bit. You did more than that. Um, I, I wrote down five specific things that I wanted to make sure to acknowledge here. So you mentioned really, the thing I really got out of it is acknowledging what's going on. So taking that accountability that, hey, we messed up, and moving forward, listening and believing those athletes, you know, and listening to the staff members that you work with, too, of color. Two, I want to thank you for really not just talking about it and being somebody that's with the staff and sharing your experiences, which you don't have to, but also making sure to contact somebody and let them know, I want to do something about this. Somebody in a past interview mentioned being about that action. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Not just saying these things, but doing more, doing something about it. Um, I want to thank you too for giving us that inside look, that backstage 
sneak peek of what is it that you all talked about when these did occur. Um, because some of these things we, as a fan or as just an observer, we are not aware of. We just see what the commissioner comes out with in the statement. So thank you for giving us that behind the scenes. And then um, you mentioned the emotional, feeling emotionally drained, being thankful that we have these friends that came out to talk to us and let them know that they're here with us and they stand with us. But I think you said it perfectly, that term emotionally drained, because I resonate with you during those two weeks, how that felt. And uh, again, there, I could go on on my soapbox of what you shared. So I just thank you so much for sharing all of that. Before my last question, Carla, can you share with us where people, if you feel comfortable, where people can follow you um, to either gain more advice because you ooze it throughout this entire interview. We can talk, I feel like, for five hours, honestly. <laughs> but where could people follow you if they wanted more advice and just to really continue the conversation on what they can do moving forward? Sure. So um, I am on Instagram all the time, which I don't know how because I'm constantly working. But in between, I like to dabble in social media. Um, I love TikTok. Uh, during the pandemic, that was like my thing, right? Um, so anyway, my Instagram handle is at Carla Bugs. So that's C-A-R-L-A-B-U-G-S. Feel free to uh, uh, direct message me. Um, I am definitely going to work on my social media presence a little bit more so that it's less um, what's the word platonic and a little bit more professional. So I really want to make sure that my social media presence marries up to what I do for a living and what I'm clearly passionate about, which is educating, supporting, equipping players, NFL players in their careers, um, and getting ready for life after football. Thank you. And Carla, you, I can't, I can't thank you enough for the time that you did spend with me and just the knowledge that you shared with all of us and insight. I look forward to continuing this conversation and this alumni Springfield relationship. And <laughs> before we wrap up, is there anything that you would like just all of us to be more aware of moving forward? You know, we all have some type of whether you want to call it mission, Mm -hmm. or goal what is something that you would like us all to you know take away from this interview or know of the impact you want to continue to make on the nfl yeah um something that's really passionate to me is is increasing diversity amongst corporate america um so specifically to the women who look like me women in co of color um if you do want to work in sport I think it's really important, especially if you're ever going to be working with players, with athletes directly, whether that's in a coaching position or um, something in football operations or social responsibility or being a broadcaster, and you're, you're very close to the game. Um, in general, obviously, it's, it's so important to keep that professional decor, decorum. Um, and when you have the seat at the table, even as a man, as a man of color, don't lose it. Don't lose it to something silly. Um, don't lose it to something ridiculous. Lose it to something monumentally good, right? Lose it because you have a better opportunity at the NBA or the MLB. Leave because of that. Don't leave because of some un unfortunate situation if you're catching my drift and so i'm really speaking to my generation and younger don't don't mess up you know once you get there you have to work so hard to stay there and you have to treat it like it's going to be gone tomorrow and so any move you make even if it's out of the building right and it's on the weekend and you're drinking Whatever it is, like always think, wow, but I'm so blessed to have this opportunity as a person of color, as a young person of color, I can't blow it. And so I'm constantly reminding myself that yes, I'm first a wife, I am second a mama um, and a daughter, but I'm also an employee of the National Football League, who is 
a woman of color at the National Football League. And I cannot afford to lose that title to something ridiculous. It needs to be a really good reason why I lose that position or that title. So anyway, I will stop there. I know I've, I've gotten, I've gone off a little bit. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. And, and you reminded me of uh, how we can look at pressure and how, and what way we can take it good and run with it or bad and just choose to escape it and fail. And speaking of that, I think one way that helps us to be mindful of what you were saying is having mentors. And I know you shared one being Judy and that's where I learned too how important that relationship building is, the rapport. And you hit on it even more with humanizing the person. You know, when we're able to view them as somebody that is a younger brother or sister, we're able to look at them more as, again, a human being, which is reflective and a good thing to keep in mind in any setting. So again, Carla, thank you for your time. Everything you shared was amazing. Um, I can't thank you enough for your time. I really appreciate it. You're very very welcome. I appreciate doing this and sending the elevator back down. <laughs> I caught it. I caught it. Thank you. <laughs>